welcome to the Actual Tech Media EcoCast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information that I wanna cover with you. All right, let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. So if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Now, keep in mind that if you do have any technical issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on today, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over a live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Now, if we don't get to your question during the live webinar today, don't worry because the awesome experts that we have here with us will be following up after we wrap. All right, next up, there's going to be lots of cool aha moments on the EcoCast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there on your audience console and the hashtag for today's EcoCast will be automatically added to your post. All right, our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some awesome resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection, solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. Now, if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes that we'll be giving away throughout today's EcoCast. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. First, you do need to be here live in attendance at the EcoCast in order to qualify to win a prize, and we will follow up with all of you after we wrap. Now, all winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you don't know what those full T's and C's are, that's fine. We've got the full thing for you. Just head on over to that handouts tab, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find them waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we actually have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. So in today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our live sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all questions asked after we wrap the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and you would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about your big win and we'll get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the EcoCast today, and we want to keep that good feeling going, so let's connect on social media. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We have lots of great content, and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content and resources right after we wrap the EcoCast today, be sure to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and, hey, grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or a coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now, you'll find a link to do that right in your handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. And both you and your coworker or friend could win a prize, and we hold those drawings every month. So be sure to refer a friend because, it, hey, it could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for all the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab, fill out a quick application, and the actual tech crew will then match you with some vendors that we think you should probably be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you get to choose to join in, like surveys, test runs, uh, new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you'll learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply, or hey, send that link to a decision maker on your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you all about one of my favorite resources and that is ransomware.org. You can find out everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, prevent, and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. Go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and as I said, they are completely free. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in that handouts tab as well. All right, well, we have covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get going. All right, folks, it is time to jump into the good stuff here because today we are talking about enabling and securing a remote and hybrid workforce. I am so excited to get into this conversation with all of you today because there is so much to explore when it comes to these opportunities around creating a successful remote workforce. I love the psychology of this. I love the strategy of it, the change management, and these so very cool technologies and solutions that are going to allow our teams to connect from anywhere and get their work done effectively and safely because that's what all of this means right it means that we can hire teammates from all over the world we can increase the perspectives and the talent that we have access to so that means growth and scalability for our organization and for us as humans and as co-workers it is a huge opportunity but it also comes with some very unique challenges and that is what we are here to explore today in greater detail and we are not alone in this journey. We have top experts here with us from Access Security and from Palo Alto Networks who are going to guide us through this exciting conversation. Now, I know that you are all ready and pumped up to get started, so we are going to get rolling with just a last little bit of information, and then we'll get our speakers on out here with us and we'll get started. So once again, my name is Jess Steinbach. I'm a moderator here at Actual Tech Media, and my friends and fellow moderators, Keith Ward, uh, who's here with us in live chat, and the wonderful Scott Becker waiting in the wings to walk us through our keynote chat in just a moment, and we'll get that started, but first, I want to talk about prizes. Okay, so today on the EcoCast, you could win one of three $300 Amazon gift cards that we will be giving away to three lucky winners who are here live and present with us at the EcoCast. Now, I mentioned in the housekeeping uh, chat this morning that you can find the full terms and conditions linked for you there in that handouts tab that we were talking about a little bit earlier. So if you're not sure about the full terms and conditions, if you meet those, you can head on over to your handouts tab, click in, scroll down, you'll find those waiting for you there. All right, my friends, well, that was it for the housekeeping. I said I would keep it short and sweet, we did. And now we are ready to get rolling with our keynote. And I am so excited to introduce our keynote speaker who really, let's be honest, needs no introduction because of course you already know him and that is the one and only Scott Becker, one of our wonderful moderators here at Actual Tech Media. So Scott, thank you so much for being here with us today. Now, I know you have a great discussion planned for us. So I'm gonna step back, I'm gonna hand things on over to you. Take it away, Scott. Thanks. So Jess, today we're talking about supporting remote workers. And one of the big questions for IT and for HR is how seriously to take remote work. I mean, sure, COVID-19 made it necessary for everybody. And we all invested in managing, supporting and securing remote workers. But how much do we need to develop and invest in that infrastructure? Will remote and hybrid work just a moment or will they last? So I'm going to start with a story. If you guys have been following the news lately, you'll probably know where I'm going with this. One of the things that remote work phenomenon has enabled is a digital nomad lifestyle. Few of us take advantage of the possibilities there, but a few dreamers were signed up with a company called Life at Sea Cruises. They were supposed to embark in November on a three-year cruise. They'd live, work, and play aboard a cruise ship, getting their work done at locations all around the world. Customers included aspiring digital nomads like Carrie Whitman of the Cincinnati area. She told a local TV uh, news crew in Cincinnati that she was going to run her marketing agency from the ship for the next three years. She sold her home, most of her stuff, paid all or part of the $30,000 a year cost for the cruise, and got ready to go. As you can guess, it's not working out. Turns out the company got into a bidding war for the cruise ship they were going to purchase, and ultimately they couldn't afford to buy the boat. After a couple of delays where the planned departure moved from Istanbul to Amsterdam as the company tried to secure a different ship and passengers had to scramble to make new travel and lodging arrangements, the company announced, announced that it was scrapping the whole trip. 
Is this a metaphor for the end of the remote work dream? Is this story the Titanic of remote work signaling the sinking of a future where employees can be untethered from a geographic workplace in, in IT, finance, insurance, professional and business services, and other remotable sectors? Or is this just a story of bad business decisions by a cruise company, you know, nothing more significant or surprising than that? There are certainly those who would like to ring the death knell for remote work. Every few weeks, CNBC seems to have a story about this or that development that's going to mean the end of remote work. Uh, and there are a lot of rock star uh, business um, managers out there who want remote work to, to die. So Elon Musk has called it immoral for people to work at home when certain types of employees can't. Jamie Dimon said, working from home doesn't work for those who want to hustle. And finance executive Stephen Ratner said, working from home is evidence that America has gone soft. One of those battlefronts is worker productivity. And to be honest, that is trench warfare. Everyone has competing studies. Everyone's got their own facts. I've posted some of the more famous numbers here that get bandied about. So this first one uh, in the upper left, down eight to 19%. This one comes from a study of 10,000 skilled professionals at a large IT services company in Asia. And the numbers come from a working paper out of the Becker Friedman Institute, no relation, at the University of Chicago. I've tried to read the paper and honestly, I can't figure out where they got the figure and why it's such a wide range. You know, eight to 19% is a, is a pretty big band. But it's based on 17 months of data from both before and after March 2020. So it's a piece of data to be to be reckoned with. The, the figure right below that on the slide here, down 4%, is from a study of call center workers also around the pandemic. This one comes from another academic study and looks at workers who went from the call center located before uh, or went, went from the call center before COVID-19 and then went home afterward. So that's pretty widely cited as well. Then you've got your positive figures. That 13% figure is based on research by Nicholas Bloom, one of the main academic advocates for the advantages of remote work. But this is a pretty old figure. The paper is based on call center workers again uh, from a NASDAQ listed Chinese travel agency and it came out in 2013, well before the pandemic, obviously, as well as well before some of the most significant remote work tools and technologies hit, hit the market. Then there's the stratospheric 24% figure, up 24% on productivity. And that refers to the productivity of researchers at the Federal Reserve, which seems super specific. But anyway, some groups of those researchers put out 24% more academic papers during COVID when they were working from home than they did previously. Interestingly, they collaborated more than they had ever before, you know, by counting co-authors on papers. So sort of the, the opposite of the, uh, the widely cited water cooler effect. So that's a lot of different conclusions. You, you can basically find what you like in there, but ultimately it may just come down to job type and quality of management. But you can see why productivity is a battlefront, far from settled. And there's another new study referenced here at the bottom of the slide that refers to flexible policies correlating to 16% higher revenue growth over the last three years. Basically, a hybrid work management startup did this research with the Boston Consulting Group, where they analyzed revenue growth at 554 public companies and essentially found the public companies that give their employees choice over whether to come into an office outperformed their peers with more restrictive policies. So we're not gonna resolve the questions here of whether productivity is better with flexible work or revenue growth is faster or slower with flexible work. What we can look at though is big trend lines about what's happening with remote work. And these are eye-opening. So this chart here comes from Castle. They're a provider of building access control systems. So they've got great visibility into how many people are swiping into the office every day. The type might be a little bit small for you here, but the color to pay attention to is red. That's the average occupancy in the top 10 cities that Castle serves. So the chart begins on March 4, 2020, just before everybody went home. Since it's an access control company, the lines on the left start at 100% occupancy. Think of that more as a baseline. You know, in, in reality, there were 
single digit remote work population at that time too. We'll see another chart later that, that deals with that. But you can see the precipitous drop here around March 20th, where it falls by 85%. And this isn't news to anybody, I'm sure, on, on this session. You know, we all lived through that. But since then, it's slowly, slowly come back, but not anywhere near where it was at the beginning of 2020. Occupancy rates nudged 50% in the third quarter of 2022, and have mostly bounced along between 45% and maybe 53% ever since. And this is in spite of you know Herculean efforts by Fortune 500 CEOs, you know, and others to drag workers back through return to office efforts. All right, then check this one out for some fantastic historical context. This chart comes from WFH Research, which is run by Nicholas Bloom, that, that researcher who came out with the big 2013 work from home productivity study that we, we looked at before. So this chart shows full days worked at home as a percentage of paid work days, which is a smart and interesting way to track the phenomenon. You can see it was practically non-existent in 1965 jumped into the mid single digits in the mid 80s, maybe with the release of the, the PC, but then dropped again. It got a slight boost between 2010 and 2020, but it wasn't what you would call a juggernaut. Then whammo, 62% of paid workdays in 2020 were full days worked at home. And even now, more than a quarter of paid workdays remain at home with a recent reversal in the steady fall uh, You know that's been happening since 2020 that you can see there in that, that little you know uptick spike there um on the far right side so let's go back to our original question is remote work a fad or the future i'm going to say that when you look at those charts from wfh research and especially from castle it's hard to say that it's going away and i also don't think that the life at sea cruises is a is a bellwether for remote work so too many people have gotten a taste of the benefits, both from a productivity and a work-life balance perspective. And enough managers are finding productivity boosts and even revenue growth advantages to keep it going. So it may never reach the heights of 2020 again, in a lot of ways, let, let's all hope that it doesn't. But I'd say office scenarios like the one in this image are gonna be the, the new normal. Somebody's in the office, a couple of people aren't. I hope this was helpful in giving you all some context in terms of the whole industry and the big trends around remote work. You know, we're all experts in our own organization's policies and trends, but sometimes it's useful to see what everyone else is doing and to make sure that if we make a move to a new company or as we're making strategic decisions about our own companies, to know the big trends in the industry. And speaking of your companies, we've got a poll for you guys, right, Jess? Absolutely correct, Scott. Yes, we do. We have a poll for everyone out there and we want to hear from you. So take a second right now and let us know what is the remote work status of your organization? Uh, as, as Scott said, there's a lot of ways of, of working now and, and a lot of different ways that organizations have kind of settled after all the upheaval that we had for a couple of years there. And so we're just kind of curious, are, are you 100% back to in-person? Um, are you kind of feeling like maybe remote work was there, but it's fading and slipping away? Uh, are you feeling like you're, you've sort of settled, you settled down into a nice hybrid arrangement? Um, or do you think it's ramping up that maybe organizations got a taste of it and, or your organization got a taste of it and now they want more and more? Uh, or 100% remote, never going back, that's it, that's all, that's, that's what we got. And I'm kind of curious myself. So I'm going to show you the results in just a second here. I'm going to put up a little um, uh, results slide. So you'll get to see, again, nobody's names or specifics. So don't worry about giving away <laughs> any company secrets. But you'll get to see kind of where where the audience out there is. So click, click, get on there. Click, 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 click. And I'm going to send us over to the results so we can see this all in action. Look at that. Okay, so a huge, huge, huge chunk of you kind of leaning towards that. We're, we're stable, we're in the remote, that's where we're sticking, or excuse me, in hybrid, and that's where we're sticking. Uh, and that seems to be where we're kind of hanging out. And then almost exactly even ramping up and declining. Isn't that interesting? Um, very few people in the 100% remote, uh, and and we've got nobody um, in the 100% in, the in person. So that's really interesting. I'm, I'm kind of curious how 
that's going to play out uh, in our conversations with our speakers today. And I'm, I'm uh, excited to see all of that participation from all of you. So gold stars for everybody. We have one more question for all of you, and then we're going to get into our sessions here today. And what we're wondering about is time frame. We're curious, what is the time frame that you have in mind for making some of these changes to your remote workforce? So is it short term? You need to make this urgently, maybe a little bit longer term. Now, we just heard from all of you that uh, quite a few of you have stabilized. So maybe you're more looking for enhancements rather than a total overhaul. But for those of you that are ramping up or ramping down that remote work, maybe maybe you need to make changes a little bit sooner. Uh, no wrong answers here, folks. Just getting an idea of where you're at again so that we can let our speakers know whether they're speaking to a little bit more urgency or a little bit longer term thinking make sure that we keep getting you the info that you need uh, so click on that when you get a chance last second drum roll and gone okay <laughs> All right, my friends. Well, we had to move out of those polls because it's time to get into our sessions. It's time to get into the good stuff here. And boy, do we have an exciting day ahead of us here. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce you all to our first two expert presenters in today's EcoCast. Now, you will all recognize these familiar faces and an absolute powerhouse team. And that is, of course, Jay Tilson, Director of Strategy and Field CTO at Access Security, and John Spiegel, Director of Strategy and Field CTO at Access Security. Jay and John, thank you both so much for being back here with us again on the EcoCast and for getting us started today. I know that we are in for a treat as always with you both. So I'm going to step back and hand things on over to you, Jay. Take it away. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. In this session, we're going to talk about how to secure your remote and hybrid workforce. So before we get started, let me introduce you to your host today. My name is Jay Tilson and I'm joined by my colleague and my friend, Mr. John Spiegel. Together, John and I have over 50 years of enterprise experience running large infrastructure and security teams. We spent the bulk of our career sitting in your chairs and we have experienced the same daily challenges as you have. And not just those technical challenges, but the cultural budget and resource challenges also. Recently, we left our roles in the enterprise space and moved to a company called Access Security which is now part of HPE Aruba Networking. We made this move because we both believe networking and security are mired in complexity. We both feel that stitching together solutions that worked in the early 2000s is no longer works in this new world of the hybrid workforce. We found that this approach created only more challenges and when deployed, it very much looked like a game of mousetrap. And we both believe there are better ways of doing this. So let's get started. I think we can all agree that over the last few years, the technology world has evolved faster than ever before, especially with the pandemic being a major catalyst for what we now call the modern workplace. Users, devices and their data are now everywhere, but the legacy security systems that we're so familiar with were not designed for this new cloud and mobile world. This has made it difficult to empower and protect our remote workers and the bad guys know this as are using it in their advantage. As a result, cyber attacks are increasing at an alarming rate. Ransomware was named the top threat type for 2021 with the number of attacks increasing over 140% in the second half of the year alone. Ransomware damages are expected to exceed 30 billion worldwide in the coming year. And this means that in this new world of the digital citizen, securing our remote work workforce is critical for every IT and security team to prioritize. So let's look at some more statistics. Ransomware was named the top threat type in 2021, but I don't think it would surprise anyone here today that it was also named the top threat type in 2022. However, there are other concerns for our security teams in today's world. Social engineering threats increased by a whopping 270% last year, and there has been over a 1500% increase in attacks against VPNs. This attack against VPNs has led 71% of businesses to be concerned that their VPN will jeopardize their environments, and to me that's extremely concerning. This has led to a regained popularity in zero trust. Zero trust is the concept of never trust and always verify and was first introduced by John Kindervag back in 2010. However, the move to cloud, the rise of the hybrid worker, the increase in regulatory requirements and all of these attacks we've just talked about have contributed to making zero trust a core element of every CISOs and CIO strategy. 
Well, Jay references a new strategy is needed. Unfortunately, heritage technology is holding us back. Take, for instance, how we typically access resources as a remote employee. I'm sure you're familiar with this scenario. Let's say I need access to a remote database where I keep updates for all the projects I'm responsible for. The scenario goes something like this. I open up my laptop, turn on my VPN. I traverse the internet, and then I am greeted by a firewall. After that, I traverse the VPN concentrator. Then it's the DDoS defense system, the NAC system, an SSL decryptor, an IPS system, and then yet again another firewall. Only to access my database, which lives where? Heck, it's out on the internet. I had to run a virtual IT gauntlet just to get my work done. And keep in mind that my packets likely crossed eight different security products from eight different vendors. And it's highly likely these eight different products are not integrated in any way and are likely managed by different teams. So John has just mentioned the journey of our average remote employee. However, let's look at some other options that we have for securing our workforce today. First, we have the hub and spoke design. This is really the progression from the old castle and moat design where everyone was inside the perimeter. But was this design still focuses on having on-prem security, even though users and their data had started to move to the cloud. This covers really which John talked about just now. So with this design, there is still a heavy reliance on MPLS and internal data centers. And in my experience, this model is complex to configure and to administrate. You need to feed and water the applications to ensure they remain secure. And you also have to go through hardware renewal cycles and continually patch all of your systems to make sure they remain uh, protected against attack. Then you have the next solution, virtualized cloud firewalls. This to me really is an evolution of the hub and spoke design, but it moves some of those legacy based security systems and hardware systems we've just discussed out to the cloud. The aim here was to remove some of the burdens of keeping systems secure. However, in a lot of cases, this means backhauling internet traffic to your corporate data center, to the corporate network. And although this design is supposed to make things simpler to manage, in my experience, it often led to more complexity and cost. So then there is SSE. In my mind, this is the savior, and this is the design of the future that we should all be considering. This is really all about delivering all of your connectivity and security tools from the cloud. So gone are those days of patching your systems, replacing your hardware, having to maintain everything. SSE is gonna stand side by side in you, uh, with you against the battle of the bad guys. You may be asking yourself, what is SSE or Security Service Edge? SSE is part of a larger framework known as SASE. Introduced in 2019 by the analyst firm Gartner, SASE addresses the traditional dilemma presented to every network and security engineer when faced with how to deploy a new application. What do I favor, speed or security? In the past, you can only select one and we all know what the CIO prefers. Speed, because speed equals employee performance. With SASE, you can have both. You can solve the dilemma. How? By creating a network and security fabric that extends as close as possible to the employee, the third party, via points of presence or POPs. This allows applications to be accessed with both security and performance. SASE is delivered in two technology stacks. On one side, there's the WAN Edge, and on the other side is SSE. How is this framework being adopted? Recently, Axis commissioned a report on SSE adoption with our partners at Cybersecurity Insiders. So let's dive into some of the results. So let's look a little bit at the Axis Atmos platform, which is our SSE platform. The platform was designed on day one to bring networking and security together. It's really all about harmonizing what in the past was a symphony that played as individuals versus as a team. In the past, the enterprise would have to select one vendor for networking, 
one for security, one for DLP, one for the WAN, and one for cloud security controls in many other point products. And as we all know, this leads to operational complexity, high cost, and ultimately poor security design. Access, on the other hand, start, starts with a clean slate. It really begins with this concept that we call adaptive trust. So instead of placing the employee, the third party, the contractor, or their device on the network, Atmos starts with a series of checks to verify the identity of the user and the state of the device. Access will then balance this request for applications and data. And if the calculation does not add up, then the employee is not granted any access. So building on this concept of adaptive trust, Atmos provides a global reach with over 500 edges, with services like SWIG, CASB and ZTNA all being in our POPs. It brings together what were previously individual point solutions into a single integrated platform delivered via the public cloud. And this really enables secure access for all of your employees, for those remote employees, for your office workers, and for those critical third party resources. As you begin to research the SSE space, you're quickly going to realize that not all SSE platforms are built the same. Our focus at Access Security, HPE Aruba, is purposefully built a single UI, leveraging one policy, and building a platform that brings together what were previously multiple point products. We also believe that we must simplify policy and inspect all traffic. And critically, we believe in leaving no application behind. Challenging zero trust protocols like voice over IP, ICMP, and even server initiated flows for patching, we can help you solve that problem. And finally, we offer choice. You can leverage our agent-based solution or go agentless. The choice of that is really up to you. So let's break down some of the elements of SSE and talk about how we've implemented them within Atmos. As you dive deeper into SSE solutions, you will find that each solution emphasizes one of these technology areas. It could be secure web gateway as the company started there, or it could be cloud access security broker as that was the target market they were looking at to be competitive in. We have taken a different approach with Atmos. We believe the future is about transitioning to a new security strategy based on zero trust. Only provide the resources required to perform the function, nothing more and nothing less, and then vigilantly watch for any indications of change and then adjust access accordingly. As we've discussed before, we've built our platform to deliver zero trust network access. This strategy is at the center of everything we do. It is a solid foundation that we built our technology on. We believe that the future is about delivering secure access for applications, whether they are in the cloud, in a private data center, or are SaaS-based. Services must be delivered the same no matter of the location, with security checks such as MFA and posture checks to match requests, all based on business policy. We believe we have solved this in the most elegant manner for both your employees and for those third party and contractor difficult cases we've discussed. So building on the solid foundation of ZTNA, we added features to our platform. We added secure web gateway as it's fundamental to secure your employees from the internet based threats. We then implemented CASB as a feature to secure your SaaS assets. Securing your SaaS solution with an easy business policy is critical for us. Or maybe you also want to understand user experience and how is the application performing. So we've also implemented digital experience monitoring. You can quickly uncover where an application issue is. Is it the network? Is it the device? Or is it the application? And Dem has you covered here. And it's also worth noting that these are features, as I've mentioned, and they are configured from a single UI set on top of a single data lake. So let's look a little bit of how Atmos works. As previously stated, the Atmos platform includes all the core functions of SSE. So this means we can give access to internet, SaaS applications in the public cloud, or applications hosted in your data center, all from a single UI. 
So first, the user requests access. Note this can be with or without an agent. So we've got those difficult third party and contractor use cases covered where it's difficult to install an agent. Next, the platform auto mediates the request for access at scale. However, unlike legacy VPNs, there are no pass through connections. Users do not get an IP address on your network and it cannot go wherever they want whenever they want. The system then prompts for MFA and will automatically verify against your defined access policy. This is based on user, device and application context to prevent any unauthorized access. Once everything balances, it then brokers smart and surgical connections that will help minimize the attack surface and prevent lateral movement. Please note that the platform continuously inspects the posture of the device and the user. And if anything changes, access is adapted or severed within 60 seconds. We also, as mentioned, sit on top of a single data lake for all of these services, which allows full visibility for all of your traffic. So this all adds up to protection against the bad guys while increasing your security, reducing complexity and reducing costs. So you may ask, what are the benefits of the Atmos Access SSE platform? So firstly, it increases your security posture, providing zero trust access to all of your services and applications. You get to eliminate your tax surface and reduce your exposure. You also get to enforce least privileged access to all applications and services. As I've mentioned before, including private applications, SaaS applications and the Internet. And this will help you protect your business against ransomware and data loss. Secondly, you get to deliver the best experience possible for end users and IT administrators. End users receive quick, seamless access to applications, services and data every time because of our intelligent smart routing across over 1000 edge locations. Also, IT admins can control access centrally and granularly making it easy to secure the business from a holistic perspective. And lastly, you get to optimize your business with one solution for all of your security access needs. You get to simplify and unify networking security functions and minimize complexity by reducing the number of point products you have in play. Additionally, you also get to save money by reducing reliance on application based security solutions and you can effortlessly scale with our cloud delivered platform. And customers, they are key. Their challenges are similar to yours. Take, for instance, the city of San Jose. Their challenge was the hybrid workforce. Like many in the post-pandemic world, they'd embraced remote work, but also knew the power of creating a strong work culture. The city of San Jose adopted a three-day remote and two-day in the office approach. This blend allowed them to provide the best of both worlds. But if you don't have an application delivery system to support it, worker productivity declines. After conducting an extensive search, the City of San Jose selected HPE Aruba Networks SSE as their platform. Why? Simplicity, as well as the ability to support challenging zero trust protocols like voice over IP, ICMP, and server initiated protocols to allow remote patching of systems while still remaining a strong security posture. For them, the days of VPN are gone. Or it could be like Procter & Gamble. Their challenge was different, third-party access. Being one of the largest multinationals on the planet, their base of contractors is high. Their need was how to secure them and how to maintain their intellectual property. In the past, this meant sending out thousands and thousands of laptops. Turn time to onboard a new contractor was roughly 24 days, and the cost was high. By moving to Axis SSE, Procter & Gamble was able to leverage an agentless approach. This meant that their contractors could now leverage a BYOD approach. As a result, $10 million saved and time to value went from 24 days down to roughly 24 hours. Return on investment, sub one month. That's the power of the Axis SSE platform powered by HPE Aruba Networks. Lastly, VisionWorks, a national optical chain. I'm sure you've seen one of their stores. Their challenge, 
legacy hardware. Like many companies, they were sending all of their network back traffic back to the data center for security treatments. This hairpinning of traffic slowed down their business, as well as it was expensive from a hardware perspective. By moving to Axis SSE, they reduced their hardware investment, optimized their network, as well as secured their clinic. The return on investment was realized fast, and the deployment took less than a month. 700 stores in a matter of weeks. Traffic optimized with zero trust security posture and visibility provided by digital experience monitoring. Wins all around. So where do you go from here? Well, that's really up to you. The key takeaway is that this is a journey. It's not a project you can accomplish in a day, a week, or a month. It's really a series of projects. The most important thing is to find business problems that you can solve leveraging this framework. An excellent first step is third-party access. Often this is an area of high cost and high risk to a business. If so, consider leveraging our agentless solution for ZTNA. And once you find success there, move on. Look to replacing your legacy VPN solution with an agent-based ZTNA solution. From there, look to consolidate your security tools. Leverage technologies like CASB or SWIG. And then continue your journey by simplifying your operational model with digital experience monitoring. Just keep in mind, like I said, this is a journey. The outcome for you and your business boils down to this. Lower cost to operate, reduced vendor headache, higher security outcomes with improved employee satisfaction as you gain both speed and security when delivering those key line of business applications. We here at Access Security, powered by HPE Aruba, are here to assist you on that journey. Jay and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope you found this session useful. If you'd like to discuss what you've heard today further, please feel free to scan the QR code or reach out to us directly. Oh, well, thank you, Jay. Thank you, John, for such a great presentation. Lots of awesome info. And I'm so excited that you're able to stick around and answer some questions from our audience. We've got lots to dig into. But before we jump in, I do want to point out that we have that poll question for all of you out there. So if you are sitting back and soaking in all the information, now's the time to sit back up, get back to your computer screen and click on this wish list because that's really what it is, right? You are letting Access know what what would be most helpful in terms of follow-up? We just heard some great information from John and Jay. There's so much more to learn. So this is your way to make sure that you get exactly what you're looking for, what's gonna be most helpful for you. So you think of that as your, your uh, access security Christmas shopping list. What, what would be helpful? And then the team will send it right to you. While you're doing that, John and I are gonna dig into some of your questions. John, are you ready? I am ready, can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. All right. Let's get into it. Uh, we're gonna let the audience do some Christmas shopping for access security <laughs> solution info. And uh, <laughs> let's start with this question here. Okay, are there application types that access does not support? No, actually um, uh, we were born in the post cloud, post zero trust era. So our philosophy is leave no application behind. Uh, with several of the other ZTNA vendors out there, you're gonna find some limitations, primarily in server uh, initiated protocols. Those could be like voice over IP, could be something as simple as ICMP, which can be a challenge, as well as patching for devices, depending on where your patching server is. Uh, we realized that was a gap in the industry and uh, we have solved for it. So uh, again, our philosophies leave no application behind and we're not doing that with a VPN uh, or some other function. It's, uh, it's just part of the platform, mm -hmm. same, same. Love that. Nice and easy. Um, I'm really glad that somebody asked this question because I think a lot of times we can feel, we, we get excited about the ideas uh, and, and we can be a little overwhelmed on, on where to actually start, where to jump in. Um, so we had a question here. You said start anywhere. 
for a zero trust journey. Just do it. Um, <laughs> but can you actually give us some examples? Where where would you suggest that we begin? So what do, what do you think, John? What's the best step one? Yeah, I think when we're uh, when we say that we're channeling our best John Kindervog, who's <laughs> known as the the father of zero trust, and yep. that's what he always says. Um, so where do you start? Uh, our recommendation is go after third party access. Uh, this is a risky area, um, adding contractors directly on your network, whether that's you know having them on your network or through VPN or sending out laptops uh, is, is a, a great risk. And it also can be a great cost. Uh, we worked with a major um, product uh, manufacturer. You probably have them in your bathrooms and in your kitchens. Um, and their challenge was third party access. And we did that through an agentless um, mechanism. So uh, basically it's, it's like a portal that you would see with Okta or a similar where you just click on the icons and you gain access. And it works for web, HTTPS, SSH, uh, VNC, uh, VDI, uh, your major remote access uh, applications. So start there, then start to look at your VPN uh, aspects, uh, transition that over to a ZTNA type scenario. After that, look at internet security, so SWIG, um, and then start to think about CASB, DLP. It's really a journey. Um, this movement to SSE, the SASE journey, um, it's not something that you can just overnight have run a project and then you're there and you're magically zero trust or SASE or SSE, <laughs> one of these frameworks. Um, you have to really think it through and plan it out, not only from a project perspective, but from a financial perspective as well. Hmm. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice if there were those magic buttons and and, and or checkboxes of <laughs> and zero trust achieved, done, excellent. Exactly. Okay. That would be amazing. Uh, well, John, I wish I could keep you a bit longer because there's lots more to dig into here and, and obviously lots more to discuss, but I think we're going to have to leave it there just for time's sake. We'll hopefully get you guys back on again soon. You're our, you're our um, gold stars for, for you both. You've been <laughs> <laughs> on a lot of EcoCast and MegaCast this year and, and the audience loves it. I love it. Um, before I let you go, John, as always, I do want to give everyone, speaking of that first step, what is the first step to getting started with access security? Uh, really, it's reaching out to us. Um, we're now part of HPE Aruba Networking. So uh, reach out to us, uh, hit us up on the website, uh, connect with myself or Jay, we can certainly help you out. Um, but it, it's just learning about it, um, trying it out. We have some demos as well. You can you can uh, run your own version of Axis and, and uh, kick the tires on it. Um, yeah, hit up the website. Awesome. Well, John, as I've said, always a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you guys so much for being here with us today to kick off the EcoCast. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you for having us. All right. And to everyone out there who's clicking on that wish list, keep those Christmas wishes coming or holiday wishes, whatever you're celebrating, whatever whatever you're at. Uh, get that uh, that wish list filled out. Make sure you get the info that you need from Access uh, because there's just so much information and, and we can only dig into so much in these sessions, right? So these follow-ups are a great way to make sure you get the info you need. I also want to remind you that for any questions that you asked that didn't get answered in our live chat right now, I know we have to move pretty quickly through them. Um, so please know that the questions will get sent on to the team. You will get answers back. So keep those questions coming. And don't forget that that also enters you to win that best question gift card. Remember, there's a $50 Amazon gift card on the line from each one of our sessions. We're looking at all the questions asked after we wrap. So we will get back to after we wrap up our EcoCast today. All right. But speaking of prizes, that means it is time for a prize giveaway. So we have a $300 Amazon gift card in the wings here, and I'm going to give that away to someone who is lucky here live and present with us at the EcoCast. And that special someone is Kenneth Wilson of Massachusetts. Congratulations to you, Kenneth Wilson of Massachusetts. We will follow up with you after we wrap up the EcoCast. So stay tuned for that. But for now, we are going to keep things moving right along in this EcoCast because folks, today is short and sweet and 
absolutely packed with exciting info and cool takeaways. So here we are, we are at our grand finale of the day, our very last presentation of the EcoCast. And holy, are we wrapping it up with a bang because here we have the Palo Alto Networks team. Don Mayer, Product Marketing Director Sassy is here with us to bring us on home. Don, I'm so excited to chat with you, hear a little bit more about what's up at Palo Alto Networks. We're gonna do some Q&A in the end. We got lots going on here. So Don, I'm gonna step back and hand things on over to you. Take it away. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks everyone for, for sticking with it. Uh, I'm, I'm happy and honored to be uh, your last presentation of the day. Hopefully you'll find this information valuable. Um, as you heard, there is Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, uh, to add, add them to the Q&A box and we'll address them as we get going. And, you know, following on with what our, our colleagues uh, have been talking about throughout the day, it's it's really interesting to see what's been going on. And I, I always hearken back to that proverb, may you live in interesting times. And boy, don't we. Um, I would say that right now, having lived through a global pandemic, having transformed our businesses with a variety of different cloud applications and, and cloudification of just about everything, the advent of AI and generative AI really taking hold and, and giving us some promise of things that, that could be possible in our organizations, we have to also take a step back and really understand what is at stake and, and what are we facing on a daily basis. There's some great strides we're making on the technology front, but at the same time, those great strides are also being used adversely by our adversaries, and we have to take note of that. Um, and in doing so, we have to at least put in, in place the right foundations to allow us to be able to accommodate what our users need to be doing, where our business needs to be going, and how do we continue to keep a handle on the things that are important, relevant, uh, not only for protecting our business, protecting our intellectual property, but ensuring that our users have the best access to the things that they need to stay productive and stay happy. That is a lot to take into consideration. And hopefully you'll see, um, we're taking a little bit of a different approach from some of our colleagues in, in other organizations. And we're gonna be sharing with you a little bit of what that looks like, but more importantly, again, it's sobering to understand what we're up against. You know, this is no surprise to anyone who's been paying attention. Attacks are becoming very, very sophisticated, unique and evasive. Uh, the uniqueness is interesting because a lot of what we use to be able to provide protection for those attacks is signature based technologies. They've, they've worked great in the past and they're still relevant because those oldies but goodies do tend to re be recycled again as we uh, look to either uh, update our, our signature databases or we retire things that we don't think we're going to need. Um, but signatures, you have to have an identification of something first to be able to have a signature. And the way our adversaries are using AI, they're faster than we are able to maintain a signature database, um, which means that we're grossly unmanned in, in, uh, you know, behind the eight ball, if you will, in terms of being able to stay on top of what's going on. At the same time, the tools that, that the adversaries have available to them are far more sophisticated than they ever were before. Uh, we're noticing 130 plus new red team tools available for attackers to be able to misuse a higher level of sophistication than they've had available to them before, which means that they're able to circumvent and stay ahead, if you will, of our traditional approaches to being able to provide security. And they're doing so at a very high rate of, of productivity. Uh, we're seeing 100 million unique malicious domains being introduced into the wild every day. Um, these numbers and these statistics should be sobering to anybody. Um, and it should give a, a good wake up call to any organization that's, that's trying to get a handle on things that the traditional ways of doing things just aren't able to keep up. They're, they're, they're really not designed for this scope, this scale, um, this level of, of complexity. We really need to be doing something different. Um, at the same time, we also have to embrace now how our workers and how our, our networks are architected. You know, works and apps are increasingly distributed everywhere. And it's not just because we're, you know, augmenting things from prem and going into the cloud, or maybe we're born in the cloud. We're multi-cloud. Uh, we, by design, our applications now have APIs that call out to different other either repositories or storage devices or even other applications to be able to get the data that they need to be able to perform their functions. 
At the same time, our workforces in droves have said, you know, quite honestly, we want flexibility. We want the flexibility to be able to work wherever we feel confident and comfortable and productive. But the expectation is in doing so, that experience is going to be consistent. Um, if I'm working at a coffee shop, if I'm working at home, if I'm going to a branch office or I go to my corporate offices, that same ubiquitous access should be everywhere I'm working. And it should provide me a very pleasurable or at least an optimal experience to be able to allow me to do what I need to do and stay productive. Okay, on the one hand, we have to balance very carefully the advanced attack landscape that we have. And on the other hand, we have to balance a, a workforce that wants a lot more flexibility in terms of what it is that they do. Okay, that's an interesting challenge that we have um, on the one front. But when you combine it with new applications, uh, different ways of applications communicating, different ways of our workers working, um, as you've heard, you know, we have a really interesting uh, kind of challenge in front of us, and that is our attack surface is really exploding. And in doing so, when we try and get a handle on these things, the traditional way that we looked at how we approach cybersecurity was always get the best of breed solution that you can to solve for that one particular problem. Okay, that worked wonders in the past. Uh, so we would go out and get a good SWIG product or a secure web gateway. We'd get a proxy product. We'd get a SaaS security product or a CASB product. Um, we'd get firewalls and we get all these other tools. Um, and pretty soon we have this massive hodgepodge of stuff. It's all providing alerts, all giving us a lot of information, none of which is being correlated. And we're nowhere near being able to decipher what any of these alerts mean, what is relevant in my environment, and how do I really get a handle on what's going on. Couple that with the fact that our employees don't want to be VPNed back into our data centers. Um, we saw that during the pandemic. We saw that in droves with employees just demanding a better solution. VPNs were great in terms of transporting information over unsecured networks, but as a remote access solution, they were fine when remote access was a nice to have. Now that it's mission critical, now that we have hybrid workforces, VPNing is a little antiquated because it requires you transport things point to point. Take your remote workforce, bring them to some security center uh, where typically that's your, your premises where all that security processing is done, then hairpin them back out to the applications and the internet services that they need to. That's a very taxing kind of uh, path for being able to get access to applications. And most users understood that. And if they were savvy enough, most users would turn off their VPN. If they did so, then again, we lose visibility, we lose control. Not only that, if they're going out to the internet, um, they're going out in the wild, there's nothing else on their system that's looking at what potentially they're going after, what sites they're visiting, nothing policing their activity while they're in the internet until they turn that VPN back on. Well, by then they could have collected something <laughs> out in the wild. Um, they could have had a, a, a drive-by attack, uh, download some malicious content onto their laptop, they turn on their VPN, they VPN back to their corporate headquarters to get access to their private applications. And then that malware now has a wide open uh, transport route to the corporate offices where it can then start to unleash its holy hell uh, bad. We're, we're in a really interesting situation and it's just getting worse and worse as hybrid users are now adopting more BYO devices, we're seeing more IoT devices, we're seeing a lot more explosion, if you will, in terms of our attack surface. What does all this stuff really mean for us? It means that we are looking to try and, and modernize and trying to um, accommodate a new way of doing security, but we can't just lock everything down. And we understood that because as we just described, when we have a process that is too taxing on the performance, users are gonna bypass it, they're gonna circumvent it. And we saw that in droves throughout the pandemic. If we are too lax with our security, then we're exposed. So we've gotta find that right balance, if you will, between optimal security, optimal user experience, and continue to do that everywhere our users are, everywhere that our applications are, everywhere that any bit of data is gonna be able to be transmitted across our distributed environment. 
Um, that's a lot to take into consideration. And then when you take into account, we still have prem, you know, large distributed enterprises, large global multinational organizations still have prem. I mean, they've, they've gone into the cloud as much as they can, and they continue to expand in the cloud. But their premises environments aren't going away and their data centers, <clears throat> while they are able to move things to the cloud, not everything can port over. There's still some legacy applications and quite a bit of it that's going to remain on prem. So as we heard in the previous section, you know, taking into account the traditional applications or the applications that still live on prem is something we still need to take in, you know, take into account as we're looking at building the right infrastructure to accommodate remote access in a hybrid environment. How do we do that? At Palo Alto Networks, you know, we've been fortunate. We've been thinking about this for quite some time. And more importantly than thinking about it, we've been implementing various technologies over the course of time that help us get to a, a, an interesting inflection point, an inflection point that allows us to now start looking ubiquitously at access, whether that is local access in a particular office environment, whether it's remote access from a remote office site, uh, a remote campus, if you will, or whether that's remote access from a hybrid worker who is at his home office, at his uh, coffee shop, local coffee shop, at a Barnes & Noble, if they're still around in your areas, at the airport, wherever this, this worker might be. And collapsing all of this infrastructure into a, a singularity, if you will, a way to be able to devise a single policy, a single point of, of enforcement, a single point of visibility and control, if you will, to be able to accommodate the needs for our hybrid workers, to be able to get access to any application, not just the internet, not just a SaaS app, not just their data center or private applications, but any application across any domain, any port, any protocol, anywhere. Not just do that in terms of providing access but do access in a zero trust framework. You, know, you hear a lot of zero trust. A lot of people use zero trust. A lot of marketing is now using zero trust and apologies for that. Um, and you hear ZTNA or zero trust network access. Um, it wouldn't be cybersecurity without an acronym soup and a bunch of new acronyms being introduced all the time. And it can get confusing, but it's important to understand zero trust is a framework. Zero trust is a construct. It's, it's an ultimate destination we want to get to, and that is eliminating implied trust. Why do we need to do that? Because the majority of what we've done in cyber has always been on the premise that any of our users are going to connect inside a secure facility. Once they've you know, handed off their credentials, once we've validated who they are, they have a purpose of being there, and thus we're no longer scrutinizing them very, very heavily. And you'll see that when you go into a corporate office, you flash your badge at the uh, the security desk or you badge into a, a security turnstile, um, you get access to your floor, you plug in your laptop and away you go, you're, you're able to do your things. Um, a lot of that security is handled right at that authentication or that, that first instance where the user is coming into the office. Well, without users coming into the office, we have to think a little bit differently about these people because the constructs that we've used before are all based on that simple premise once they've you know shown their credentials they should be trusted john kindervog as we heard before has has kind of challenged that notion and that came about because we saw some interesting things happening on the campus networks one of the more interesting things was the advent of enterprise wi-fi um, and especially with the advent of 802.11n several years ago that allowed us to now utilize Wi-Fi with the same amount of bandwidth that we had in a dedicated Ethernet can drop into our, our desktops. So I could untether my desk or untether my laptop, I should say, from my desk. I could wander around campus and still be connected with the same speed as I was tethered to my desk. Well, that did some interesting things to me and, and to my desktop or my laptop, if you will. I wasn't walking around with my desktop, obviously. But I would authenticate on a particular AP. I would be given an IP address on that particular AP in that particular region or that, that location of the building. Well, then I could put my laptop to sleep, walk to a different building or walk to a different floor, walk to a different access point area, authenticate to the network again and get a different IP address. Now, all of a sudden, IP to trust doesn't make any sense anymore, right? There's no longer a correlation between Don Meyer at this IP address because my IP address is now changing. 
Likewise, Don Meyer as a, a, a named entity might change based on where I am in the particular location of that building, the particular geographical region, whether I'm at home, whether I'm at a, a, a branch office. In other words, I need to start getting some more context. I need to know a little bit more about the user. I need to know a little bit more about the request from this user. I can no longer just trust at nauseum or, or just blanketly trust someone just because they're telling me, hey, I'm done and I should be here. I want to get a little bit more information. I want to know a little bit more about what's trying to transpire here before I can allow that to happen. As you can see here in our diagram, we have this thing called continuous trust verification. One of the core tenets of zero trust is it's, it's really eliminating trust. But once you establish something, you got to verify that all the time. Trust, but verify, trust, but verify. That's what we're attempting to do here. And, and in fact, the way we do it is perhaps one of the more unique approaches in the industry. And that is we leverage these interesting tools called user ID, app ID, and device ID. We wrap that into a context ID so where we can look at, okay, once we've established who the user is, what their device is, what the application is that they're trying to access, what other security functions should we apply based on all this information that we know. And we will then make a decision about how we bring that user into the environment and how we connect them to their application based on all that context. Now, what's interesting about that is it gives us a lot more granularity in terms of what we can control. Where is Don going to go? How is he going to get there? How long is he going to be able to do that? But what we do a little bit differently where other solutions kind of fall short is, is we continuously validate that, right? No longer is it a point in time where Don passes his credentials along, the, the device looks okay at that particular point in time, and yes, I know what that application is at that particular point in time. Everything looks copacetic, boom, I'm going to connect this, this user to his application and then walk away. No, I'm going to stay in line with this, this transaction. While this session is enabled, I'm going to continuously vet Don. Hey, Don, are you still you? Hey, Don, you're changing your behavior a little bit. Something looks a little bit off. We don't, don't quite know what you're doing. You're doing something different. We've never seen it. Hey, Don, your device is doing something a little bit different as well. Um, we don't think deviations from the norm or we don't think that you know changes or a, a vetting of one time is enough in terms of being able to determine whether or not I should allow this session to continue in perpetuity. Thus, we provide this continuous trust verification at the point where someone is trying to connect to an application. We do that gathering this rich context, all that context is stored, and then we can call upon it throughout the entire session to go back and say, hey, we've built this profile on Don, he's matching to his profile, he looks good. I'm gonna come back in a few seconds and take a look, make sure he's still looking good. Yes, he's still looking good. I'll continue to allow the session to, to transpire. If Don's behavior changes, if his device behavior changes, if the application behavior changes, I can revoke Don's privileges right then and there because I'm in line with that traffic. We're not a broker, we're sitting in line with that traffic and we're vetting continuously how Don is interacting with this application. What does that do? Dramatically reduces the attack surface now. We're starting to get a better handle on what is exposed and how do we mitigate all the necessary um, challenges with regards to that limited exposure by making sure that Don device application, everything is adhering to what we expect in terms of an outcome and what we expect in terms of behavior. On top of that, at the bottom of that uh, diagram, you'll see we have this thing called continuous security inspection. That's where that content ID piece comes into play, where we'll run that session through all of the security capabilities based on what we understand of Don, his risk factors, the device, the risk factors, the application, the risk factors, or any other custom way that we want to enforce a particular policy. And we do that consistently for every application, irrespective if it's a SaaS application, something that's out on the internet, uh, something that lives in AWS or Azure or GCP or something that lives on our prem. We're going to continuously look at traffic in both directions coming from Don and his device to the application and from the application back to Don and his device and look for things like malware or unknowns or look for things like data, uh, data leakage and data loss and, and things of that nature so that we're sitting in line with this traffic again making sure that the users, the devices, everything is, is adhering to what we expect them to, and that we're not introducing anything or exfiltrating anything from that particular application. 
we think that this is the right approach to achieving the right zero trust outcomes to be able to ensure that we can adhere to what our workforces need, what they demand, and do so in a way that keeps us in control. And by the way, since we've built this infrastructure on AWS and GCP, we also have access to things like their private fiber and their private data centers. What does that mean? That means we have access to uh, peering nodes across the globe in any one of the, the points of presence that AWS and, and GCP offer that is an order of magnitude higher than anyone else in the industry. What does that mean? Higher performance. That means wherever our users are, they get an exceptionally high performing experience, which means they can get in, do their jobs, maintain their productivity, and do so in a way that, again, maintains the proper security posture. If we can achieve proper security posture at a high performance, our users are a lot less likely to circumvent or bypass or try and, and do something different than we want them to. And that's why we've chosen to partner with AWS and GCP so that we can get a better performing uh, infrastructure for our users to be able to utilize so that we can run all the necessary security capabilities to ensure that any user accessing any application will do so in a secure manner. And with that content ID, it wouldn't be Palo Alto Networks without talking about you know, the, the robust security capabilities. We're augmenting a lot of these capabilities with AI powered uh, capabilities as well that give us the opportunity to start looking at and learning from what we're witnessing. Case in point, we see malware uh, being propagated a lot through phishing attacks, whether they're drive-by, man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, spear phishing or whatnot. A lot of these phishing attacks will lure users to go to a particular website. Um, these websites, a lot of times, are being designed and built using these malware kits. Um, what's interesting about the malware kits is that they all utilize a similar set of building blocks. We've trained our AI algorithms to be able to identify what those building blocks look like. So as soon as a request goes out to a site, we're looking at that site, not just, you know, hey, have we seen this site before? No, there's new sites popping up all the time. We established that. We're looking to see from the code down, what does this site look like? Are there telltale signs that this was designed from one of those, those malware kits or those root kits um, that would be an indicator that this is a, a malicious site? If we can see that, we can stop that, that uh, session from even reaching that site in real time, prevent that user from email, being able to even get to that site and learn what does that site look like uh, so that we can share that even you know, if we have never seen a site before, we can share the same insights in terms of evaluating what those sites look like so we can keep our wares up to date without having to rely upon signatures and new signatures being introduced all the time. Likewise, with unknown variants or zero-day exploits, we can look at the entire attack lifecycle, and we have all the necessary capabilities in that attack lifecycle. So even if something gets through, something goes to the application and it wants to embed itself and then reach out to its command and control server, we've got all the necessary capabilities in line with that traffic to be able to thwart that command and control session right there at the application, quarantine that application, and mitigate or prevent that malware from being able to reach its its ultimate destination. That's the value of having all that continuous security inspection and the AI powered capabilities tied to it. So that's kind of how, how we're approaching zero trust. That's why we think, you know, the the approach that we're taking is 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 uh, more aligned to how organizations want to be able to deliver the right set security capabilities, the right security outcomes and the right performance uh, and right experiences to their uh, organizations and their employees, I should say. Uh, that's pretty much what we wanted to talk about. I know we've, we've only got a limited amount of time. Wanted to, to again, showcase that all of this and even more is available uh, on demand. We just recently had a, uh, a, a, con a conference on SASE uh, called SASE Converge where we showcased these capabilities and some new capabilities that we're introducing across our entire SASE portfolio. Um, encourage everyone to go in and, and register and watch the on-demand portions of it. You'll see this and a whole lot more there. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it back to the moderator and see if we can open up for some questions. 
Thank you so much, Don. What a great presentation. I love that. I'm, I'm leaving this QR code up for just one more quick second. Run, run and grab it. But don't worry, because if you miss this now, you can still access this through the uh, handouts tab. So there's a link over to the Palo Alto Networks Resource Center, the SASE Resource Center. There's all kinds of great stuff, including access uh, to get this on demand. So if you miss it in the next 10 seconds, head on over to the handouts tab and gone. Okay, what you're seeing up on the screen now uh, is that wish list again. That's your that's your holiday shopping list from Palo Alto Network. So what we're wondering is what would you like? What do you want in your stocking? What's your stocking stuffer of choice? Do you want a data sheet? Do you want a technical white paper? Customer case study? I mean, these are great. It's better than candy canes, right? So if this is what you're looking for, click on the screen. Let Palo Alto know how they can follow up with you. Make sure you get the the follow-up resources that are going to be helpful for you. While you're doing that, Don and I are going to dig into some questions. Don, are you ready? I certainly am. All right. We're a little short on time, so we may only have time to get to one of these. Um, and I'm going to zoom in on this because we got a few questions about from folks who clearly have legacy systems and, and worried about existing infrastructure and connections. So um, do I am I going to need to replace or update my access infrastructure in order to be able to deploy or get the benefits of Prisma access? Wow, that's a great question. And a lot of times um, organizations are, you know, somewhat apprehensive about bringing mm. something like this into their environment because they think, yeah, it's going to require forklift upgrades. Um, the really nice thing about Prisma Access is it's designed around standards. We use standard IPsec protocols to terminate connections in our cloud. In doing so, you can use existing infrastructure, an existing router, an existing firewall, anything that speaks IPsec. You can then program it to point to us and then absorb what we do, all that zero trust network access uh, capabilities that we just talked about without having to make any other change to your infrastructure. And then over time, you can start to retire some of those capabilities um, and absorb more SD-WAN or other things um, as your use cases and as your needs evolve. But to bring this capability into your environment, it's simply just a subscription to our cloud service and then point your devices to us um, if you have laptops or our, our other devices, we do have a client that's embedded into our Prisma Access. It's a very simple client. Um, it works with SSO. Your users don't need to do anything other than just log into their laptops. And it creates that always on connection that provides all that same robust security. So it's seamless. Uh, and that's what it's designed for is just a seamless transition into this better, broader kind of architecture, if you will, that allows you to start modernizing and uh, uh, really getting the right foundation for how you want to evolve your, your security capabilities going forward. Well, Don, I wish we could keep going. We're, we're running out of time. Luckily, you just answered two or three of the questions that came in in, in one answer. So well done. And, and uh, I do want to ask you before you go, though, if anyone is looking to get a little bit more information, you know, wants to either get started or, st or start asking some questions about Palo Alto Networks and how that might work for them, where do you recommend getting started? Yeah, come join us at paloautonetworks.com. Um, there you can find our SASE pages that have all the, the latest and greatest information on the product that we were talking about today, Prisma Access, as well as our entire SASE portfolio, uh, paloautonetworks.com. Just come on by. And we're happy to, to have further conversations. Nice and easy. I love it. Don, thank you so much for being here with us today. This has been a ton of fun. You were an excellent grand finale to our Ecocast. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure being here. And everyone out there who is clicking on that poll, keep that up. Also, keep those questions coming in. A reminder, not only are you entered to win that $50 Best Question gift card, but we are going to make sure that you get answers back from the Palo Alto Networks team. So again, Don and I had to run through that live Q&A at the end, but there's a, still a chance for you to get those answers that you need. So please do keep those questions coming in and we'll make sure that you get some answers. Uh, Russell says, really enjoy the topics today. I'm glad you did, Russell. Always great to get into these conversations. I have to say, I've said this before, the remote work conversation is one of my favorites. I really like remote work. I really like the zero trust. These types of things where we get to step back and think about approaches and strategies are really cool. And the technology and solutions that we've been digging into and exploring a little bit today are enabling some awesome opportunities for workforces. So I hope that you guys are all feeling really pumped up and ready to take action on some of these conversations. Um, I do want to get into our very last prize giveaway. But before we do that, I'm going to remind you all to make sure that you hit that handouts tab before we go 
Uh, I hope you've been opening tabs throughout our session here, but if you haven't already done so, make sure you've got that tab open for the Palo Alto Sassy Resource Center. There are papers and blogs, use cases. I mean, just anything you could want to know all right there, handy dandy in one place. So make sure you've got that tab open, hold on to that uh, and go spend some time exploring after we wrap up. All right, so right now we have another $300 Amazon gift card in the wings that we are going to give away to two lucky winners. We have, we have two $300 Amazon gift cards. Now I will remind you that again, you do need to be here live and present at the EcoCast. And our next winners are David Mayers of Texas and Panam Patel of New Jersey. That's David Mayers of Texas and Panam Patel of New Jersey. Our full winners list today, Kenneth Wilson of Massachusetts, Massachusetts. Oh boy. David Mayers of Texas and Panam Patel of New Jersey. Congratulations to all three of you. As always, we will follow up with you after we wrap. So stay tuned for that. And if you asked a question today, you are entered to win that best question gift card. Again, we follow up after we've had a chance to review all the questions. So stay tuned, my friends. All right. Well, on that note, if you've been sitting on the EcoCast today and thinking that this was a good time and you might have a story that you'd like to tell, we would absolutely love to have that conversation with you. So please do reach out to us, connect at actualtechmedia.com and we'll see about getting you on a summit at EcoCast, a Megacast, a webinar, whatever you have in mind, shoot us a message and let's see what we can get rolling. Okay. Well, with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to once again thank all of our incredible speakers here with us today from Access Security, from Palo Alto Networks, really for making this EcoCast possible. Uh, and, and, you know, as I said, I, I really enjoy these conversations and I think there's a lot of different angles that we can approach. And I think that our speakers today all had different insights and different ways that you can be thinking about how this may or may not work at your organization. We talked at the start, you know, some of you are ramping up, some of you are ramping down, but regardless, the vast, vast, vast majority, almost 90 some percent um, were in that either we're, we're using it, we're hybrid, we're, you know, whether you're ramping up or ramping down, you're in a hybrid state. So this is important for everybody, regardless of industry, regardless of company size. Uh, and it is important to be thinking about these solutions, especially as we head into 2024. It is no longer an excuse. You know, we had to make a lot of changes and adapt very quickly on the fly when everything kind of fell apart in, in 2020 and in subsequent years. But there's no longer any excuse, right? We've had enough time to, to stop, to pause, to start going back and fixing some of those things that had to be done quickly and now we can do them well so now is the time if you're still dealing with some of those legacies from 2020 and you want to fix them now's the time so i'm glad you all took some time out of your day today to join in this conversation to maybe gather some insight and information uh, and start to think about the opportunities that are available to us with these distributed and, and remote and hybrid workplaces, uh, because th that that's a huge, huge growth option for our organization in terms of extending the, again, that talent pool, that resource pool, uh, being aware of different budgetary needs. I mean, there's just 101 reasons to consider this as part of your workforce structure. So I'm excited that all of you were here and interested and hopefully are taking some cool ideas back to your organization, back to your teams to kind of carry that forward into the new year. I know we're hitting the end of the year here and, and things are, are crazy crazy. So uh, if you're if you're thinking longer term, I get it. All right. Well, um, I'm going to wrap things up here in just a moment. But I do want to remind you all to make sure you've got on your calendar the Megacast all about cloud tools, products and services critical to cloud success. Basically, all the good things related to cloud, right? Tools, products and services, everything you need to be successful. That's Thursday, November 30th. Oh, my goodness. That is tomorrow. Wow. That happened quickly. All right. So Thursday, November 30th at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just shocked at how fast November's over. Uh, come, come join us for that megacast, and we would absolutely love to see you there. And until then, I hope you have a wonderful end to your day. Thanks, all. <laughs>